back. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the show, we are still in the month of March celebrating Women's Month. And so this morning, we're having a conversation with a very esteemed panel of women. And these are all women in leadership as well. We're joined uh, by Sherilyn Vidal, who is the Director of Public P Prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, we have in the middle Salome Tillett, who is the principal of the All Girls Cath uh, Catholic High School, St. Catherine Academy. And we have Sandra McKay, who is an insurance manager and realtor, of course, from the business sector. Good morning, ladies, and thank you for being here. And happy morning. Women's Month. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I want to start off by just uh, getting a bit of insight into your own personal backgrounds, right? Um, I find that oftentimes women who ascend into leadership, uh, they have two different paths. You stumble into it, uh, perhaps not realizing your own capacity, or you had a particular drive as to where you wanted to go. Which, which would you say was your particular path? Yeah, for me, it was a natural progression. Yeah. I started working at the DPP's office in the year 2000. I remained there for my first contract. I, I left the DPP's office and went to the AG's ministry, still in the post of Crown Council. Mm -hmm. And I then went to act as registrar when the registrar at the time was away studying. Then I returned to the DPP's office and I've pretty much remained there since, apart from a, a short stint with the police department. But I was promoted to senior Crown Council and then to deputy director. So I was deputy director when the director at the time left the office. And so it was a natural progression to the right. post of, right. of director. Not that I aspired to it, but I, of course, welcomed it with open arms when it was offered. Go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, for me, I think it was just a part of my natural progression was my leadership style, I think. Yeah. I've always been the leader. And from a child, I was always the one who controlled the marbles, <laughs> who <laughs> decided who would go first. Yeah. And um, high school, the same thing. And so um, for me, I, I find that it's leadership comes naturally. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that it was recognized because the truth is when I became the second lay principal of St. Catherine Academy, I was 33 years old. Oh, so I was fairly really young really. at the time. So I believe the sisters saw something in me that made them think this little girl, relatively yeah. speaking, because that has always been a position for an elder person, mm -hmm. could take on this challenge. And, and I've really enjoyed all the years since. Yeah. Well, you've heard the term. She had a ring leader. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that a lot in my childhood. So <clears throat> your story, Salome, sounded a lot like mine in, in childhood. Um, didn't realize when I moved into business that people, again, similarly, would have seen something there because I was just doing what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. I thank God for a good upbringing that taught me to be very disciplined and to make sure I do my part wherever I go to contribute positively. Mm -hmm. I was in banking for 14 years and um, got all the promotions that were natural to, to, you know, to move up and with one left to go to get to the top. At the time, the bank was, Barclays Bank was a structure of a B signer and then an A signer. The, the whole structure changed when it, when it changed to First Caribbean. Um, I left as a B because I changed to the insurance career, which I was pursued aggressively to come mm. over into. It took them three years to get me over and three years after I got over, I was heavily pursued to manage Guardian Life. And so again, I never looked for it. But it followed me, and um, after Guardian Life merged with RF, not merged, um, RFNG bought, of, bought over the Belize portfolio, I continued in the same capacity as an insurance manager. Being a realtor, um, my dad always taught me there is no word such as can't. Mm -hmm. You can do anything you want to do, and that's a dream I've had for a long time. Um, and so I guess all of the leadership opportunities allowed me to see my own capabilities to come into my own yeah. and to do my own business. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you, <clears throat> what are some of the challenges that you have faced as women in a leadership capacity? I know that while your stories are individual, uh, it has not been all peaches and cream <laughs> in terms of getting to where you <laughs> respectively are. My friend to my left mm -hmm. said that she assumed the position when she was 33 years old and likewise I was appointed to act as director when I was 33 years old and I think it was a, a combination of my gender and my youth mm -hmm. that made it very difficult for some stakeholders to interact 
with me and still today even though I'm a little bit older <laughs> now there are police officers in the high command who really do not appreciate being directed to do certain things mm -hmm. by a female who is significantly younger mm -hmm. than than they are and that has been exceedingly difficult for me but I see with the younger officers they, they look at you and they don't see gender they look at you for guidance and they they want to be want to be led the male mm -hmm officers who are new to, to the department. But there st still seems to be a culture in the police department that, you know, this is a man's world. world. But in my own office, the female prosecutors outnumber the male prosecutors. And the male prosecutors are blind to, to gender. We don't have any, any sense of them thinking that they are entitled to something more, they should be treated in any particular way that is different from the female, female prosecutors. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge is usually with the persons outside of the office, not within the office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For me, um, my area is a female dominated area, education. Mm -hmm. um, it has good and bad, bad aspects to it, but I have to say my um, greatest challenges have come from women. Mm -hmm. I find that there is a, instead of a support, there's a lot of um, negative, negativity, especially if you're perceived as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And I think when I came into leadership as an outsider, I was not a SCA girl. I came from a village in Corozal, Libertad still part of my village. I went to Corozal Community College, so I was not the inside person who everybody may have assumed would have naturally succeeded into that position, and that created difficulties. Yeah. And then moving beyond that, it was um, feeling that, um, wondering, well, let me say not feeling, but maybe just a question, is, does race play a factor? You know, Belize, here we are, let's be real. Mm -hmm. Does race play a factor in how we socialize and how we interact with each other? Um, and also, they, I would bring it back again to, to women, you know, the difficulties women have in being supportive and positive to each other. It's always easy, I don't know where we learn it, but we learn how to be complaining, how to be superficial. We look at how you dress, we look at how you talk. We don't look at what's beyond that. And I think that, that has created a lot of difficulty or it created initially. Mm -hmm. The good thing about it, I learned to look beyond. Because often when you look beyond the first encounter, you see the good in the person, you know what is the, um, the heart. Because sometimes we want to achieve the same things in different ways and so if I can understand that other people want to achieve the same thing like I do I was able to get beyond this the pushback that came from not being a part of the inside group and being the you know the yeah. SCA mercy girl that was my challenge at the beginning it certainly hasn't been all peaches and cream <laughs> <laughs> that is so true <clears throat> I think that as a woman in leadership there's a natural tendency to want to nurture, because that's what women do. And um, leadership, for me, was always about servanthood. I, I get that. I get that leadership is not about power and position. It's about serving the people you lead. Um, and I found that it was OK when you had to play the role of the, the nurturer, um, the servant. But leadership has with it the important aspect of steering, guiding, and that comes sometimes with disciplining. That's when I, I recognize that as a leader, a woman leader, you get the resistance. There are lots of persons who don't want to be corrected, who <clears throat> resist the fact that you have a role to play to help them get to the, the next level. And um, I found, I'm thankful that <clears throat> my experience has spanned over 20 years because what I have found is that staying the course as a leader and fulfilling all aspects of your role, not just the one that persons find, find warm and fuzzy, 
but the ones that you yourself don't want to have to do, but need mm -hmm. to do yeah. if you are to help people grow. Right. I have found that over the 20 plus years, so many have turned back to say thank you. So many have turned back. I could remember somebody walking up to my office where I am now at RF&G and said, Ms. McKay, I came here just to ask you for a few minutes to say thanks. Do you have a minute? And I recognize that as a woman in leadership, you're like a mother figure in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do. Mm -hmm. If you want your child to grow into the kind of citizen to contribute positively to the community and come into their own, you have to take the high road where you don't get caught up and want to beat them and react and you know abuse them, but to correct them still, mm -hmm. to discipline and to make sure the child understands why that wasn't a productive move and what can be done differently. Mm -hmm. That's what people not, are not always receptive to in the moment, but over the long term, people are thankful. You know, this conversation is one we have yearly, and I think it is absolutely important because where we do have particular faces, like yourself, of women who are in leadership, we still struggle mm -hmm. in being able to have proper representation Correct. or equal representation of women in leadership. Mm -hmm. And we have heard, obviously, that there's advo uh, people advocate for... Uh, a quota system being built into into uh, or government or into our laws so that we can ensure representation and some feel that perhaps the empowerment of women will help others uh, be able to elevate their own selves but from your perspective why is it important to have women in leadership position what difference does it make if we are all equals and men are capable of the same thing as women should it matter if it's a male or woman at the helm it shouldn't. I think that when we are looking at, women, at men, I, I would say from my limited experience, men tend to make leadership be about power. Whereas I, I, I'm biased here, of course, but I think <laughs> women take it, tend to make it be about solutions. Yeah. We want to fix it. This isn't where it's supposed to be. Let me move it right now. Yeah. Whereas men is about control, power. I think you will find more women who will be willing to be the boss, but do something that is maybe considered menial, whereas a man who is the boss would say, no, I, I won't go there. That's not my job. Um, I don't know if it's a, how we are socialized as children. Like, you're, you know, you're, you're always taught to be the nurturer, which may not be a good thing, you know, because um, when you are the leader, you have to make the tough decisions, mm -hmm. as Miss Sandra said here. But people tend to think you shouldn't because you should be nice. <laughs> exactly. You know, you, you should be nice because you're, you're a female. And you have to make tough decisions in the best interest yes. Yes. of the bigger organization. But I think we tend to do it more from that perspective of what is the common good as opposed yeah. to men who tend to think of it in terms of how it makes me feel and make me look and my, my macho. Yeah. Can I, as a sole male on the panel, <laughs> can I humbly beg to differ? <laughs> well, I you was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I am very pleased mm -hmm. to look at the way some men that I, I know yeah. carry out their role in leadership. And to answer the question, really, it doesn't matter if it's a male or female. The objective should be the same. The, the end goal to grow people, to help people be the next generation of leaders yeah. should be the same. Your style might be different, but the objective should be the same where it, the focus is not on you. The focus is not on your power and the authority you have to dictate, but the focus should be on the person that is in front of you and how you can make a difference. So I believe how we're socialized has almost everything to do with that challenge that we see. Because unfortunately, you are the rare species. You are the endangered species. Yes. The male who would take that road of you know, looking at the big picture yeah. and be a servant leader and help people to come up. Um, I have a, a difficulty with how some mothers raise boys. Because in my own experience in my life, too often I, he I have heard um, Left alone, it a boy. Mm -hmm. Enough he do this, enough he do that. The girl left he do that. Who said? Who says? And I think that creates a mindset that causes a lot of difficulty yeah. as boys become men and men become leaders. Yeah. 
And that's where we, we encounter challenges uh, mm -hmm. in, with, with particular men uh, who, who have that view. But I, I want to bring it back because our socialization is key here. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I fundamentally believe it. We, we teach girls to be nurturers. We teach mm -hmm. boys to be, and in all fairness, we put a lot of pressure on men because they have to be the providers. We raise them that way. It seems to be changing a bit now and there seems to be more openness. But ultimately, when we think, or you think, because I've heard you all mention the same common thread here, of yourselves as children, I am very sure you heard exactly what I heard. No, she only bossy. Right? There was no leader. Boys were leaders. Being assertive was seen as being aggressive. And being aggressive is seen to be very unladylike. And it is something I see when I work with, when I talk with young girls, that it is still a challenge. It, it is in the speech with the, how cutesy I talk to people if I want to get something done, versus being able to express how I feel about something with a certain mm -hmm. level of authority. I, in your own workplace, and, and I'm sure uh, Ms. Till has the most, uh, the most influence, um, but obviously you're working with prosecutors, you're working with police officers, you're working with other women up and coming. Are you seeing a change in terms of women being able to understand that they have a place and that it, they can be comfortable in taking, uh, in taking up that space within the, the different sectors you work? Definitely, definitely. But Malani, if I could just go back yeah. to the question that you had asked before. I think it's a question of, of competence. Yeah. Sometimes you get the impression that it is not that women are not in certain positions because they're not as qualified as the men who hold them, but mm -hmm. simply because it is thought that it is better for a man to hold that particular post. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it that in the house, the majority of of era representatives are male because the women are simply not not competent to run and and succeed in a particular area is it that the path is just made for for them to have that kind of of opportunity and to to answer your question yes there, there is a change in the way that women see themselves but then there are opportunities granted to, to certain persons so obviously in my office I'm working along with prosecutors they had the opportunity to go and study and fulfill their ambitions and they're educated and trained and they're working in the field that they love and they're going to have a different view of the world. Mm -hmm. But what about the girls who are not getting that kind of opportunity? When will they be able to get to the point where they can say, this is not all there is to my existence. The world is my canvas. I can paint it the way that I, I want to, to paint it so that some people have the opportunity to change the way that they can see themselves and the way that they can think. But Others are still being robbed of it. Do you believe it. that in our present society, where women have pretty much taken up the lead in many aspects, when you look at education, for instance, you mentioned that um, the field is primarily women. Do you believe that our society, the way it is presently, is more receptive? towards women in leadership positions, where, whereas, for instance, in your department, you are the person at the helm. And there are a lot of officers who are men. There are a lot of other persons who you deal with who are men. Do you believe that they are warm to having women lead them in certain direction? Not across the board. Mm -hmm. Definitely not across mm -hmm. the board. There are enlightened men among you, <laughs> but there are several yeah. unenlightened yeah men as well who yes. seriously still think <coughs> that there's some posts only for men, there's some positions only for men and they can't fathom that a woman would actually hold it or hold it and do well at it. You know, in my field, the majority of leaders are women. I'm um, in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you look at the companies, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the majority are headed by women and um, I don't n know of any problem that people have with that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe the governmental side versus the private sector side, we're seeing something different, not sure why, but I know it happens in the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. All right, But I can just, for the sake of fact, state that in the industry, the majority of leaders are women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I want to venture into saying that <coughs> more things are decided by men at a bar mm -hmm. than in any boardroom. I'm so glad you brought up the <laughs> yes. boys club. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Because you meet yeah. your friend mm -hmm. and you go take a drink and even if you had a meeting and you couldn't come to an agreement in the meeting, you leave the meeting and the men will go to the bar <coughs> and they will decide what will be the next thing. Yeah. We know that. When we look at the well, you know, Catholic schools, we tend to fundraise a lot. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the, the financial power of the woman, the men could go, you could go ask the gentleman, what can you give me? We are building a building. What, is, what contribution can you make? I think he could tell you right then, yes or no. Or I could give you 5,000, I could give you 10. Mm -hmm. We've gotten lucky, we've gotten 75. We've gotten gifts like that. Mm -hmm. Ask his wife. She has to go home to ask him. And then she will come back and say, well, my husband is giving to his school. And then this is what I can give you. And they're both working. Mm -hmm. And we could assume that whatever they have belongs to both of them. Mm -hmm. So there, it is still the men who run it. Whatever, we have a, whatever strides we have made, it's good. Mm -hmm. But the men still run it. How does that well, work for gender equity? Well, I think what we have to do is to teach our girls, the next generation of girls, because maybe, maybe we right here, we are guilty. Well, I might be guilty. We were taught, you be a good wife, which means, as the Bible says, Sandra, mm -hmm. your husband is ahead, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what we were taught, and so you, you operate from that. But these young girls, well, maybe we should be teaching them that too. But we also have to teach them, you know what, don't. Your dream shouldn't be to be someone's princess. You need to make your own dreams come true. You need to get out there. You need to be the engineer, be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. Stop having dreams that we will marry this rich person that's going to take care of our bills and we'll ha that won't happen. Mm -hmm. So since that won't happen, what will you do to prepare yourself? And I like the word assertive. Let's get our girls to be confident and assertive. Because if we put them in a room with boys, I don't want my, my girls, I will say, to step back and let the boys dominate. I want the girls to have confidence to stand, stand their ground, challenge the boys, mm -hmm. feel equal. Mm -hmm. Because we weren't taught to be that way. But our girls, we can do that for them. And they, they, I think the strides are there. Also where you mentioned about the man being the head of the home, biblically mm -hmm. speaking, that is true in terms of the protector, the voice of comfort, the, the, the soother, the provider. But really, in the same Bible, a woman is the man's helpmeet. She's mm -hmm. a partner. She's not supposed to be you know, under some subjection mm -hmm. to him. And so as a partner, you're supposed to be making decisions together, mm -hmm. and you can feel comfortable you know, playing your role in that aspect. It also speaks to the woman being the voice of wisdom. And so in yes. Proverbs 31, you will find the Bible saying that her value is far above rubies. The ruby is the, the jewel in the king's crown to signify his kingship, but her value is far above rubies, which means when she speaks, it's good for the man to listen because she's going to say something that can steer the family, that can steer the business, that can steer the decision yeah. in the right direction. That's the role we play, whether we like it or not, because it's how we were created. If he to is be. wise. Yeah. If he's wise. <laughs> I mean, and, so, and so women have to be comfortable yeah. taking up that role. And as Salome said, not stepping back or, you know, cowering because you feel yeah. the man should take all the lead in everything. You have to help. It's You're an interesting with scripture, though, because people love to pick and select <laughs> what parts they're going to be. Yeah. We've seen that time and time right. again. But it is what it is. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about this from, uh, you know, you, you brought up the point before about women being particularly hard on you when you first took up the leadership of the school. We hear this all the time, that women are extremely hard on each other. It, have you found that to be the case? <laughs> and from your own analysis, what seems to be the challenge? Everybody quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go first. I think it's, it comes from a lack of respect. Like we don't respect that your perspective is different from mine. Mm -hmm. Like we could look at the same object 
but you are looking at it from a business lens i'm looking at it from an education lens you're looking so we're looking at the same thing with three different perspectives but instead of respecting that we're seeing it slightly different i want you to see it the way i see mm. it and when you don't see it the way i see it there's something wrong with what you're mm -hmm. doing you know and as recent as last week i heard a uh, women having disagreement with, you know, there was a 20,000 women march and some women felt strongly that it shouldn't be and some felt strongly it should. And I was saying, but well, why do we have a problem with one effort? This is one effort. It represents good. Your effort might be different. So your effort represents good too. Why can't we see that all four of us want the same thing, but we're going to work to achieve it in a different way? Let me respect that in you, but I think this is our problem mm. as women. We mm. tend to tear down each other, like be really yeah. negative and vicious, and, and it, it seems easier for women to do it. I don't know why. It's unfortunate we don't have the, the political perspective, because I know that's one of the areas where we really hear challenges in terms of how uh, it is extremely difficult for women to get support from other women. You know, it seems to be sometimes, I, I, I feel like people function on this, this issue of women function on this um, belief of scarcity, that there can only be one female leader, um, mm -hmm. and so we're all going after one spot. And so it's almost automatic. Yeah. I can tell you personally, automatically pe women would meet me who I don't know and want to attack other women in the very same field. Mm -hmm. Instant, as if I am automatically aligned to do so. Mm -hmm. And... I have a fundamental problem with it because if I do that to someone else, that's the only thing that will come back to me as well. I welcome and respect other people in the same profession that I am because we know the challenges <laughs> and nobody else will. But it, it continues to be something that we see and I can only imagine that you have had that very same experience because it can be isolated to just uh, uh, the politics and media so far. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a fact. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the greatest challenges I've had in leadership have come from women. Yeah. And I think one of the things you, you kind of alluded to it just now is that people and, and women, since we're speaking with, about women in particular, don't realize we're all leaders. Mm -hmm. Not because maybe somebody has a position per se in the organization and uh, makes it exclusive to them as the leader. If we would embrace the fact that we are all leading people, mm -hmm. perhaps we would be more careful as to how we respond and not react to situations because people are watching and people are learning something about you that they may want to follow or may not. And heaven forbid that they should follow the negative path if you are showing a negative example. And I think if we would embrace that we're all leading, then we have a reason mm -hmm. not to tear down, but even in the face of adversity and challenges, yeah. to seek to respond in a way that builds up and that finds the solution yeah. rather than focus on the problem. It seems to be so easy for one person to focus on the problem and then rally somebody else and then rally somebody else and before you know it, you have a clique and they're fighting against who should be the leadership and then it, it's counterproductive. Yeah to the achievement of the goals at hand. Yeah. So I, I think the embracing of each one of us as a leader, as women, yeah. could be a reason to be and do differently. Let me ask an honest question here, without getting personal or without wanting to solicit personal responses. When you look at the individual roles of yourselves as women in leadership positions, how do you balance that with the dynamic of being at home with your family, the relationship and the marital aspect of uh, where you are in your lives? How, do, how does one find that balance? I, I'm going to take that one <laughs> because I'm very comfortable with that one. I, I think, again, we have to understand who we truly are because guess what is true? Whoever we are will show up everywhere we go. You can't choose to be Miss Nice Person at home and then get in the workplace and show a different picture or vice versa. Be a horrible wife and a horrible mother and get in the workplace and try to play, you know, as if you're all that. <laughs> and so if you're talking about balancing it, 
to my mind, it's really if you are authentic and honest about what you bring to the table as a leader, my experience has taught me that who I am at home, I can comfortably bring to my role of leadership outside the home. Because in the home, you're leading and everybody is leading again, yeah. but what you do. And so if I am in the, in the capacity of leadership in the corporate world, and I have to make tough decisions at times, I'm comfortable if I know my motivation is clean, if I know the heart, the heart from which I had to do what I had to do. And if I am at home, I operate the same way. Sometimes hard decisions have to be made, but because of the motivation from which it, it, which it came and the heart that you had towards making the home stronger and better and progressive, you're comfortable. So um, I really don't take work problems home. I take a vacation every night. When I get home, I'm on vacation. When the alarm clock rings in the morning, yeah. vacation finish. And I get back into my work mode. I refuse to stress out myself. I hear a lot of women saying they don't sleep. Why? You did what you had to do, and you did it with a clean heart, and you are hoping that it worked for the greater good. And so go home and enjoy your family. Enjoy your vacation. Do the same thing when you get there for the family. And don't get it too mixed up. We're not all as fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that yes. over time. Yes. I had a very good mentor who taught me that. And I never thought it was possible. But when I tried it, and I faltered, I tried it again. And I tried it again. And now, it has become my modus operandi, and I refuse to go back. You because the other way, <laughs> the, other way the other way, the other way, the other way was so stressful. One night, I dreamt of some big biting dogs, biting me in the back of my head because of worrying about yeah. how people yeah. responded to what I was trying to achieve yeah. in the workplace. Yeah. I no longer do that. Okay. So I take a vacation every night. Asani, you said you were going to ask an <laughs> honest question. <laughs> I think you actually meant you wanted an honest answer <laughs> to the question that you were, yeah. you were asking. I, I will say that this has been an extremely difficult mm -hmm. journey for me. I focused on my career in the early part of my life. I had my first child late mm -hmm. and it was just ironic that immediately after I had Marcella, I was appointed as acting DVP. Mm -hmm. And it was a tremendous challenge just taking up that post and having a little baby. And I didn't have a husband whose stress level was any less than mine. Mm -hmm. So it was, I mean, very, really hard for, for the two of us to, to adjust to it, but as time passed, it got easier. I got better at time management and, and better at de-stressing on the way home so that when I got home to my family, I wouldn't take any of the, the difficulties of the day. I had my son, Joshua, just a year and 11 months after. And again, <laughs> it, it, it read, it's, it's head now I had two little babies to deal with, and then I was actually confirmed immediately after I had Joshua as, as director. And in those days, we didn't have the, the number of, of prosecutors that we had now, and, and things were really difficult at the office. I had to be in court full time, and then go home and, and deal with the children. And this, I think, is, is one of the difficulties that a man holding this post would not experience Sorry. because by and large the men who have held this post have had wives who were homemakers of and course. so they would go home and they don't have to go and tend to children and help with homework okay. and ensure children are ready for bed and and things like that but that was part of my function as well and there were some really dark days at the at the beginning mm -hmm. but I said it was a difficult journey it was also an amazing journey and now that my children are are older and we can have really meaningful conversations. <clears throat> I work immensely hard during the day, and when I, I get home, everything is so much easier <laughs> now, and they, they understand what it is I do, they understand what it is their father does, they understand our stress level, and they have incorporated just being there for us into, <laughs> into yeah. their routine. And I, I think that it is really important to try to 
excel at everything. And I, I feel like sometimes I still fall into the trap where I have to, to give and take with, with certain things so I'm not performing at the, the optimum in relation to one area of my life. But th there's always the quest to ensure that I'm giving everything in my life the attention that it deserves. Mm -hmm. And I can't say it's as smooth as <laughs> I made it out to be, but it's a daily you challenge. Get one, you, have to, you have to meet. <coughs> I would just add that, um, oh, in our culture, our men are still adjusting to their wives as leaders. They still want the wife to come home and bake the 30 years, find my socks, where's my blue shirt? <laughs> you know that kind of thing? Yeah. Men are still there, so you could go out there, you could be, you know, the, I guess, whatever. Our female highest. prime minister. Yes, and then you come home, and then your wife, mm -hmm. and your mom, and mom, where is this? Mom, I can't find that. And then I think there is a shifting of the roles. Yeah. Again, because of how we socialize, they go home, and then you are the nurturer. So mm -hmm. now you're no longer the, I find the leader. Although Sandra, you know, her perspective is slightly different. You go home, and your role now is the nurturer. Make sure everyone has food. You have a visitor to your <laughs> house. Servant. Make sure, you know, you still have to, <laughs> and servant, <laughs> literally servant, not servant-minded, but the servant. So. This is what, yeah. these are the rules we have to juggle because when you go home, there's no one to tell, go get this, mm -hmm. go get my coffee. You better g make sure there's coffee for everybody else. You know, that kind of yeah. way. So I think our men uh, as a whole could be more supportive of women in that way. Yeah. Because it's how the boys were socialized. They were taught, you know, your wife will wash, your wife will iron, or she will make sure mm -hmm. the ironing gets done, even if she doesn't do it herself. And it's well, women who raise the boys. Right. Yes. You do have to remember that. One of the things that I think, listening to Salome, I have to mention is the support I get from my husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has been tremendous. Sometimes I wonder what I did to deserve a husband like him because he is just so supportive and understanding in what I have to do. And that makes my load a lot lighter. I yeah. think he has been like my therapist. Mm -hmm. He listens. And he doesn't listen to give me a solution, but I just need to vent sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he listens. And I remember mentioning it at the, um, the women's conference that I attended that I don't know that that's the norm, but I know that I deeply appreciate what he brings to the table to make sure that whatever I go through during the day, I don't have to bear it alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, all of that has brought me to this point now where I know Home is a haven, mm -hmm. and I no longer have to be dealing with coping with what happened in the work yeah. world for the day at home and trying to deal with that, with the family, taking it out on them or any such thing. I have someone who is very supportive, a husband who fortunately came up in the era where the mothers were teaching the boys responsibility and, you know, the role that they play and so on. And therefore, and even if I look at my brothers and the way they were brought up. I'm thankful for that generation that made the effort for everybody to know you play a role. My mom had a chore list, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was the only girl and three boys, but oh. everybody had the tasks that they had to do for that week. Next week, the chore list changed, and you done a garbage, carrying out garbage today, you done sweeping, you done yeah. full the water bottle, so you done whatever. So it was inculcated from you were Out you were of that, I have been blessed with a husband yeah. that came through that system and is extremely supportive. That helps as well, and that's why I said that, yes, there are some endangered species out there, but there are some good men yeah. in our society who I think might have a role to play in bringing up the others who are not really subscribing yeah. to the full role of the male. And men are feminists too. I always mm -hmm. tell people, you mm -hmm. find men who really support mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. I found men who really support strong mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important exactly. because if you are fighting for your own space and fighting mm -hmm. back home to, exactly. to, to kind of balance out your strength, mm -hmm. it, it, you're going to burn out very quickly. Mm -hmm. But I, we're, we're running out of time so mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come back to one of the, the main issues. We are still struggling as women in this society. And I think it's wonderful to have examples of women like yourselves in leadership. And there are many others. Um, and there are many other women who take on non-traditional roles as well. But we still have issues. We still see the domestic violence issues with women. We still see the 
gender-based violence that takes place, the different sexual assaults that's taking place. We know how women are very often victimized, um, the younger ones especially on social media. And I feel that sometimes while uh, women who are in leadership positions are trying to speak out and trying to remind young girls that there are possibilities for them in their future, it, the message isn't always translating. What, what do, would you say to a young woman coming up who perhaps is struggling with uh, a first job where she's being ignored for her capacity because she's young and she's a girl, or uh, a girl who wants to go after a non-traditional job in a male-dominated field? What do you say to them about how to be able to blaze through that trail on their own? You know, Melanie, I'm going to... I'm going to, to answer this question in, in a strange way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you that I would, I would give that, that girl a great pep talk about how they, as I said earlier, the world is her, her canvas and all of that. But since I was invited to come on this show, I've been thinking about this issue in relation to the profession at large, not just my role as, as DPP. And I was going to come here to say that I think that there has been a tremendous shift in our profession mm -hmm. and that there's no longer a bias mm -hmm. against females because the the former president of the bar association priscilla she had this great idea to do a, a magazine on women in the law women in our profession and it's going to be released next month and i had the opportunity to interview one of the the women ambassador lois young barrow and Part of the interview was in relation to the early days in the profession because she was one of the first few female advocates and at a time the only female attorney who was going to court and doing cases. And yeah. when I spoke with her, she told me that those days were horrendous days. She said that she would go into court and she would make a submission and the male judge, because there were only male judges, mm -hmm. would criticize her and belittle her and demean her. And in another case, a male attorney on the other side would make the same submission and it would be so well received yeah. and he would be praised yeah. on how well his submission mm -hmm. had been made. And she said that the attorneys, the male attorneys at the bar had their own little clique. She said that they were almost clannish and they excluded her and it was a very, very difficult time for her. Yeah. Now, I had the opportunity to informally interview an attorney who was also practicing at the same time and his view was that that's not how it was. She was, she was too emotional. It was her, yeah. her perception. Yeah. But I, I got the idea that, indeed, that's exactly how it was. But she spoke about more female attorneys graduating and a uh, shift in the, the thought process and a change in the bench. And I would have come here and I would have said that I don't really see it generally. But I've been speaking with, with some attorneys in the past couple of days. and. Their view is that the male bias is still there. It is definitely still there. They say that as females, they feel as though they have to work harder to get the respect from other mm -hmm. attorneys and from the bench. And one of the counsel told me that when a, a woman is difficult but brilliant, she's only spoken about in terms of her being difficult but when a man is difficult and brilliant in the profession, it is only his brilliance <laughs> that is spoken about. And I, I don't know that I would be now in a position to say to, to someone who is thinking about getting into the profession that we have arrived and we are at the point where when you come in, you're not going to be looked at and your gender is going to be seen you're just going to be heard and you're going to be judged on your preparedness and your submissions and your competence in court i'm actually going to have to say if if this is your ambition if this is what you want to do you do it but when you get there this is what you're going to meet and this is how we can try to prepare you for this and it's sad because we're in 2018 i i remember maybe around 2002, once I was walking down the steps of the court and the Chief Justice at the time saw me and said, Ms. Branca Tate, 
You didn't go like that dressed to court, did you? <laughs> were you wearing pants? Remember, you I was wear wearing pants. pants. Yeah. I was wearing wear pants one of my fancier pants suits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I said, excuse me, CJ, I said, you didn't go to court in pants, did you? So I said, yes. I, I honestly yeah. thought he was joking. I said, no, no, no that is inappropriate. I said, CJ, yeah. what year are we in? But I was told quite, quite <laughs> recently that yeah. a judge <laughs> actually upbraided counsel because he said, well, if you're wearing pants in my court, they have to be sufficiently far from your skin. Oh my God. <laughs> and what you're wearing right now is inappropriate. And I mean, I don't think in this day and age we, we have to be concerned. But once upon a time, they, you, mm -hmm. you couldn't wear pants in court as a female. Well, uh, it may have been a year after that incident with yeah. the CJ on the step that yeah. a female attorney actually appeared before him yeah. in pants and was told that he would not hear her. And it caused quite a stir yeah, at the bar. But then eventually we were allowed to wear pants. And amazing enough, that was within my lifetime because mm. I do remember yeah. that That's quite well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I can't say what I thought, but well. let's go. <laughs> what would you say? I mean, because I, I, I think it is important that we talk about the achievements that you've been able to make. But ultimately, we do know that it still is a challenge. And we don't want to discourage or dissuade young girls from taking up that challenge, but we can give them advice based on our own experiences. So, Well, I do agree. We can't tell them it's going to be peaches, but what's going to make it easier is that the boys now think differently. The boys, I'm thinking my sons, the young men, they aren't boys who, they have mothers that work. Mm -hmm. And so I think they will be more of uh, um, uh, supportive role to wives. I can't see the young men now thinking their wife will come home and cook for them because the girls won't do that and the girls are letting them know that that the, a lot of the traditional rules are no longer going to be what they will fulfill. Um, I think if our girls understand that where we have come has been because of those people who were brave and fearless and who did what had to be done and so maybe in their area, they will be that person. They will, they will have to be the one that will be the shoulders that the other girls will stand on. But someone did it, and that is why we are where we are now. And they may have to do it for the next generation, but every step is forward moving. We are moving forward. Um, I like your term, the world is their canvas. The girls can do anything, they can be anything. The careers that are open through technology, they know now they could be anything, any part of the world. They don't have to think, what can I do in Belize? Mm -hmm. they can could I think, interject? Yeah. You know? Maybe the girls at St. Catharines know that, Ms. Ms. Tillett. I read so many statements of girls who are victims of crime, and the statement starts off with their name, their age, and that they're a domestic. And these are teenagers. They've already been taken out of school. They don't know that they can go out there and they can try to further their education and they can have all these opportunities open to them. Their lives have already been sealed to them. It's compulsory for them to go to school up to a particular age and when they've met that age, they're going to be home. And the next thing that's going to happen for them is that they're going to be married off to someone. And while maybe we in the city are teaching our, our daughters what they can be and trying to teach our sons how they should be when they get older, there's a large part of the population where those things are simply not being taught. Exactly. It's, it's business as usual from the days gone by. And I think that we have to recognize that and we have to try to address yes. that as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, but come back though to technology because technology is what has moved us from city. We don't have to be limited to city. Where we are, the technology has raised the borders. So the girl in the village, wherever, I'm from a village, you know, they, what they have is the same exposure to what the girls in the city have. Mm -hmm. So it, I think what you speak to is a bigger problem, a family structure problem, a, a, almost sounds like a crime problem. It, it, it's bigger than um, just a girl problem, but with the girls that we have, I think we, this is where we start. And I think the moves in the mini, by the Ministry of Education to increase the number of persons in high schools, increase access, increase exposure and that should be our focus that, yes. yes that yes. is it is and um i have to say i was in attendance for a little while at the um 20, women rally and i heard girls from all over this country and they spoke of empowerment all over this country 
but it doesn't take from the fact that there are, as in any other country, in even the most developed country, there are girls who still need, because of the family structures that they come from, they still need more, but you know what? We start where we are and the circle gets wider and wider. Each generation, it gets wider. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we ha what we have to work with, getting it, broadening the circle of empowerment for girls. I like the way the conversation is going because we were having a conversation before we came inside the studio. Yeah. And we were kind of, well, I was saying the same thing that um, although we might sit here this morning and say, uh, well, this is what I would say to the, the young girls and so on. We have to find a platform where we can say it nationally. Yes. Because there are so many who are not being reached to get the right messages, yes. as we rightly heard, in the homes, first of all. And then you come out the homes and you go into the school and you might not sometimes find teachers who are ready to empower and help girls to know that you you can stand no matter what and you can be who you want to be so we have to find ways to get the message out nationally and what i would say stand be who you know you ought to be even though you're a female continue to pursue the dreams that you want to achieve even if you're not getting the promotion that you thought you would be getting, you continue to bring your very best mm -hmm. every day because that same statement I made earlier, you are leading anyway, whether you have yes. the position That's or true. not, mm -hmm. you are influencing and you are impacting. Nobody can take that away from you because you didn't get a position. And so you are still going to, at the end of the day, achieve the goal you wanted to achieve in that way. Maybe you didn't get the position and maybe you can make a choice to go out on your own and do what you need to do in the area that you chose to work in and, and, and so on. Maybe there's a different way to work in that same industry, profession, whatever. But whatever post you have, whatever role you play, you stand for what is right. You don't compromise to get a promotion and you be the best leader you can be mm -hmm. and continue to make a difference in your community and in your world. Nobody can stop you. Mm -hmm. awesome. All right, ladies. Well, thank you very much for leaving us off with that charge. I mean, there's so much more we can get into, but absolutely no more time. And I think while we have only scratched the surface as to what your experience may have been and some of the lessons we can pass on to younger girls, we hope that we've been able to at least offer some uh, support and additional guidance to women who are watching and also to men who are interested in being a part of their journey. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about the first national research conference. It's coming up. Thank you.